Hi folks, Steve Caposa here with another quick campfire chat. Today's an overcast rainy day, so I'm just going to stay inside and talk about a few things. I want to talk about fire progression and fire making and progression through history, man's history, and also talk about primitive fire, whether it be you know um, a hand drill or a bow fire drill. And I also want to say, I don't want to say too many negative things, but I just want to make my point that I think primitive fire is a waste of time and it's unnecessary. And hopefully if I talk about the history of fire, I can explain why and the reasons behind why I think primitive fire today is a waste of time and it's unnecessary. Now, if you want to do primitive fire, make both fire drills and so forth, that's fine. I've got nothing against what anyone does. I'm not going to go out there and be a dictatorship and force people not to do things. But as long as you do it, you know, as long as you do it as a, as a hobby to reenact old school ways, um, it's a novelty act. It's a circus act. It's a crowd pleasing circus act in my view. You can have a crowd of people around you. I'm a hero. I'm a bushcraft hero making a bow fire drill. Spectacular. Fine. But where it crosses the line into like survival and bushcraft, that's what I, I'm against. I've got no problems doing primitive fire. And I guess the final excuse for primitive fire is, oh well, it's for emergencies. If you've got nothing else, you've got primitive fire. Um, Self-reliance long-term self-reliance, wilderness self-reliance, all these buzzwords which come around and YouTube's full of this and I'm sorry to say this but I'm not convinced by all these buzzwords. I'm not, not convinced by the argument that primitive fire is necessary for emergencies and so forth because I live in the real world, I'm a practical person and I'm not just not convinced that you can put primitive fire into modern bushcraft and camping and say it's for emergencies. I, I just stand by it. What's an emergency? Mankind's been living for thousands of years now without primitive fire and everything seems fine. We are still here. We haven't died or become extinct. So I just don't buy. To me, it's just a novelty act and a circus act and that's fine. And if you want to recreate, reenact old school ways, people reenact the Civil War, put the gear on. It doesn't mean you have to do it, we don't need it, but people like reenacting old school ways, especially people who live as hunter gatherers and so forth, and just wear a loincloth and walk around with no shirt on like Matt Graham and so forth. I mean, that's fine, Cody Lundin supposedly living um, as a hunter gatherer, so that's fine, but we can't mix it up into um, the modern day because it's unnecessary. And let's talk about that a bit more. Um, basically, a good example is Horace Gephardt. If you don't know who Horace Gephardt is, look him up on the internet. He was a camper um, and he wrote books and that's why he's become famous. There are people on YouTube who talk about Horace Gephardt as some sort of a great bushcraft hero. I'm not too sure why, but he has got some good ideas. His books are online on the internet so you can read up about Horace Gephardt and what he used to do. There's no evidence Horace Gephardt used primitive friction fire. Horace Gephardt used matches to start a fire. Why did he use matches to start a fire? At the turn of the 19th to 20th century, matches were an invention. They were the latest invention and they superseded flint and steel. That's why he used matches, because it was the most convenient thing you can just buy and use. Um, he didn't, there's no evidence he used primitive fire, bow fire drills. Um, he used matches. The guy was a practical guy. If Horace Kephart lived today, he would buy a tent, and probably use a lighter to um, make fires. He might use um, a ferrocerium rod, sure, as a novelty, but he was a practical guy, he was a practical camper. And if we go back further in history to Otzi the Iceman, this 5,000 year old mummified body they found up in the Alps, the guy had percussion fire. He made fire by percussion. So after Primitive fire, friction fire, came percussion fire. Iron pyrite, which is like rocks with a high iron content, and with a flint or hard stone, it can bash sparks of iron pyrite. Otzi the Iceman had iron pyrite and flint, plus tinder fungus, and at least 12 other species of plant materials he was collecting to try to make tinder to make fire from sparks from his iron pyrite and flint. There was no evidence he had a bow fire drill or friction fire. He used percussion fire. 
So even by the time of Otzi the Iceman, which is 5,300 years ago approximately, um, primitive friction fire was superseded. Superseded means it's finished. No one uses it anymore. So percussion fire superseded primitive friction fire. But if you want to know how they made fire back you know, through um, Roman times and in the medieval times, it was flint and steel. Because iron pyrite, percussion fire, was before steel. Otzi the Iceman lived in the Copper Age, before steel. In the Stone Age, steel, I'm not too sure when percussion fire started, but definitely the Copper Age, with no steel, percussion fire. Come steel, it became flint and steel. So flint and steel then superseded um, percussion fire. It was still percussion fire, but it was steel, flint bashing sparks off um, or flint or some sort of hard chert quartz or something to bash sparks of steel. And of course the sparks is molten metal. You bash small pieces of molten metal which burn spontaneously in the atmosphere. Everything wants to burn. Even steel burns. Rust on steel is the steel burning. It just burns very slow because the surface area is small. But if you get very large surface area by bashing off tiny um, flakes of steel, it will just burn spontaneously. Percussion fire with iron pyrite and a rock with a high iron content. When steel was invented, you had flint and steel. And you've got those nice rings of steel that go around the hand and flint. Through the Roman times, you would have a tinder box where you collected tinder very fine stuff which would start with sparks. So if you stopped for the night for a camp, you had your flint and steel and a tinder box. And then along comes what the 17th, 18th centuries. Matches were developed over time. There was no single invention for matches that was developed over the course of a hundred years. And by the time we get to the turn of the 19th and 20th century and Horace Gephardt, you had pretty good matches and he started fires with uh, matches. He would carve feather sticks, and you can argue that's bushcraft, but he had to. He carved feather sticks because he had to. Three or four feather sticks each time of various sizes, stack them up, a match, put wood on top, and he got to have a fire. He would burn down the coals and he would cook. So that's how he started fires. If you go back before um, even percussion fire, it was primitive friction fire. Primitive friction fire probably survives to this day in very Aboriginal primitive peoples in the Amazon, New Guinea and so forth because they don't have steel. These really primitive people don't have steel, so it's friction fire.